their guests, their locals and friends. We are proud to welcome the international community to Lusanes. It is, it is a great honor for us to host the Wireless Battle Mesh 2011. We are grateful that so many people took this opportunity to join in this event from European countries like Belgium, France, Germany, Slovenia, or Switzerland, as well as from more distant countries such as Canada, USA, Russia, and Israel. We sincerely hope that you have had a wonderful time here in Catalonia, learning about our Catalonian food, culture, and of course, the Giffy.net network. This is a very special occasion to bring together the international community and Giffy.net supporters here at the SACS meeting. Together, we can foster the exchange of ideas and experience from everybody in the spirit of the free and open community. We hope that all participants enjoy their stay and share a rich experience together. These relationships are critical to the success of the community we, which we are proud to be part of. We wish a successful continuation of the event and a safe trip home. Thank, thank you and uh, enjoy uh, your stay here. Ben, ben volguts y ben volgudes. En aquestas peralos comencem la dera jorda de la quarta edició de la Wireless Battle Mesh, la qual hem volgut celebrar conjuntament amb el vostre sax. En vez de començar, però, us volem dir que ha estat un autèntic plaer tenir l'oportunitat d'estar entre Bustarades aquí a San Bartimeu del Grau. Y us volem agrair la bona estada que ens heu brindat. També us volem dir que ens fa molt goix veru com any rear any la Wireless Battle Mesh va creix i que en guany ja hem superat la cinquantena de participants i hem aconseguit creu les fronteres d'Europa. És per això que des de l'organització també volem agrair els esforços que han hagut de fer tots els participants per poder venir fins a quest poble tan bonic de la comerça de Lluçanès. Esperem que gaidiu molt a quest jornada i on s'aereu tots molt benvinguts. Moltes gràcies a tots. <laughs> ne next time in Chinese. Um, I hope um, that gave you a very good feeling about our mutual um, meeting here because, you know, partially Catalan and partially English and everybody. So we have two who try to do the effort into the other world. And I hope um, that gives you some courage to do the same. Um, we will... We will present, each of us will present um, himself a little bit and the community where he's coming from. And before we go into that, we want to show a few pictures of the last days so that those of you that haven't been there get a rough idea um, how the wireless battle mesh is like and what we are actually doing. So on uh, <coughs> in the web on Picasa, you will find 
um, the pictures from from our event made by uh, one of our most supportive uh, Catalan guys. I think a warm welcome is And of course, we have uh, for this wonderful location and occasion, we have to thank Roger uh, because he was doing the bulk of the job here on the ground that we cannot do. I think we should give him a warm welcome as well. Roger, get up. <laughs> um, so he found us this location that you can see. On the screen, you see a lot of routers and cables and notebooks um, until late in the night, hacking, doing stuff, talking, socializing. I think that's a very important part of the wireless battle mesh. Um, I hope in the, this day, you, some of you might come forward and join one of our talks that we prepared. Um, they are not so technical. We try to find some topics that are understandable by normal human beings. <laughs> so feel free to join us later um, in our own track and see what um, we are working on. Hmm? Albert, yes, but we already had that one. Did you miss it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for giving us this opportunity. <laughs> well, yes, just uh, just we didn't have really slides about the presentation of the battle mesh. This is the fourth battle mesh we do, and uh, finally to just present to the Gwifi people and the Sax meeting, you see some pictures of the event. Um, basically, it's a mix between. Uh, Deploying, which takes quite a couple of days, uh, an actual mesh network of uh, 25 nodes uh, currently, and a mix of discussion and talks about a uh, mesh network. I was not really awake for this picture, um, but it's okay. So uh, it's really a mix between discussion and talks between the different protocols that can be used in mesh network for wireless uh, infrastructure and a real case deployment with 20 plus nodes that we will uh, stress uh, this afternoon and tonight uh, being deployed. Some are powered with solar panel and some are deployed with normal uh, power supply. So uh, if, you, if you want to come over tonight uh, to see the real actual deployment we did, uh, feel free. I have uh, two announcements uh, as we are together, and it's more for the um, battle mesh people. <coughs> um, as to organize such an event, we have to get uh, some uh, financial aspects, uh, and we would like this event to be uh, to be uh, zero deficit. Uh, we're going to do a box tonight of uh, to give uh, to have donations of 10 euro each. So you, you give if you want. It's based on a voluntary uh, uh, aspect. Uh, but by having, let's say, two to 300 euros, we will be uh, covering all the costs. And if we get some benefits, we will put them in the organization of the next battle match that uh, will be probably in Greece. Uh, last announcement. For the people that uh, leave uh, before 10 AM tomorrow, they should uh, approach Albert uh, to organize the um, going to Vic uh, trip. Okay, that's all, folks. Yeah, if, if you want, I can, I can translate uh, <laughs> to Catalan the, the last word. Uh, Simplemente, no sé si tú tomo antes, pero hay un tema importante que se me hace que es económico. Yeah, ah, for battle match. Está correcta, doncs. No cal que ho digui, lo dels 10 euros, vale. It's okay. It's what it is, also. 
Okay, now it's on. No, no, I. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of slides on our website. I think I hope you know. If you don't know, uh, Griffinet website is like this: griffinet.net. <laughs> Go to the web, and um, and first of all, I was also thinking on. I'm giving thanks to all of you for coming here, and, and now I, that I'm now I'm repeating, but it's also a, it's all the time a pleasure to meet everybody. Some of us we already meet before in other meetings, but every uh, every time we do uh, an event like that, we see now new faces. We are more people, and it's nice to uh, to see these things happening. And the best thing on all of on top of all of this is that. Uh, uh, to me, I mean, uh, uh, wireless networks or community networks or bottom-up initiatives or whatever name you want to, uh, to or however you want to call it, is uh, something that happens locally in a certain place, I mean, in several countries and so on. So it's important to share knowledge, to make relationships, because actually all of us are doing the same. So these things uh, like the battle mesh and so on needs to to happen quite often. Uh, on the other hand, about I'm talking a bit about Giffinet. Uh, I have a slide. We have a website. I think it's the best is going there because everything is there. Uh, it's just I will say another uh, uh, another experience of uh, all, all the things we are doing. And just uh, if I have to to tell in short words what we do. I just say uh, we are not just a community wireless, in fact, because we are also trying to use other technologies and whatever things uh, get useful in order to communicate. We're uh, talking about extending the internet, that's the whole idea, uh, uh, enabling the users as uh, builders of infrastructures uh, for getting, so, uh, and that's, what makes a bottom-up initiative instead of just waiting uh, to make a contract with an ISP and get a service from it. Let's do the infrastructure by ourselves, uh, by our initiative. And then let's own the infrastructure and as a community uh, extend the, the, the internet, which is very much, it doesn't matter if we are self-organized as a community or as an association or as a whatever. In our case, we have a foundation and we try to aggregate as many initiatives across the territory here in Catalonia, uh, cooperating with all of us. I mean, it's not just in San Bartomeu, it's also happening in Barcelona, in Castellón, in other parts of, of Spain. That's the, what very likely it means. Some, some people are coming to us and asking, yeah, but how did you guys grieve that much? And we didn't grieve that much because in every village that has a hundred of uh, nodes and is already plenty of it, we are, we are not growing there. We are growing because we are joining with more initiatives across the territory with the next village, as I will say, and that is actually what makes the trick. So we are not a single uh, wireless community. We are about uh, aggregating each other and cooperating and giving that response to that name. But there is l many communities working on that. And I think it's a good way to, 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 you know, to, to join forces and, and uh, reach the critical mass that you need to win because there is a lot of technological uh, uh, stuff to be, uh, to be developed to make it happen, but also social stuff, juridic stuff, lots of, it's a, it's a social event to make this thing happen. So it's really a, a, a huge challenge, but also very encouraging. And, and, and again, it's, uh, because of that, it's always a pleasure to, to, to join with, um, with more people, to meet more people for other experiences in Europe, and in, because of that, gain experience for, for all of you. So first of all, thanks.
to everybody. Hope you enjoy it to stay here and see you in the next battle match. Hi, um, I am giving a, a very short and uh, highly biased uh, story about the Freifunk project. Um, I am Kloshi from Subsignal.org. I am from Leipzig. I studied at the Bauhaus University in Weimar. Uh, in 2001, we were inspired by projects like Consume the Net in London and uh, ASCII Amsterdam, which was squat.net, and uh, they did the mobile mesh thing. Um, in 2002, there was a conference in Berlin, um, the Berlin Conference, um, which was about uh, building an international wireless community. Uh, at this event, the Pico Peering Agreement was born and the uh, vision of a meshed future was there. So, the Pico Peering Agreement, just for those who never seen it, it's uh, just loose terms about uh, how owners of nodes should uh, relate to each other. So it's about free transit, open communication, no warranties, and some terms of use, and probably some local amendments added to that. Um, with that, we thought, at that time, we could build a framework for the, or basic rules for how wireless mesh communities could work. Um, in 2002, we founded uh, wireless.subsignal.org in Weimar. Um, our first experiments we have, have been with AODV. Um, at that time, we were having a close look to Vienna, a Funkfeuer project, and the mobile mesh project, which was also back then happening in Berlin with Elektra. And uh, so we were experimenting a lot with technology and suddenly something new happened. Uh, in 2003 and 4, both parallelly Vienna and Berlin communities were working on OLSR, the Open uh, Link State Routing Protocol. Um, in Berlin, the project named olsrexperiment.de was founded. In Vienna, parallelly Funkfeuer uh, got running onto that. And these have been the first real-world implementations of OLSR in numerous, numerous nodes, uh, numbers of nodes. So uh, in uh, 2004, the name Freifunk suddenly popped up. We, for example, in Weimar changed to Weimar Freifunknet. Of course, there was Berlin Freifunknet, Leipzig Freifunknet, and a lot of communities more, so Freifunk is a roof for all the community wireless projects. M meanwhile, there have been 50 to 90 existing Freifunk projects, some of them not existing anymore, some just little, some big. How we started? Back then, we used uh, old 486 machines uh, with PCMCA ISA adapters, which is these little thingies here to put in a 486 machine. We used uh, Orinoco wireless cards, which was the future of wireless technology back then. Antennas were really hard to get, um, and we were using a Zizella single floppy Linux distribution doing all that for us. Um, the website is on archive.org because uh, it is does, doesn't exist anymore. Um, so this was very painful. Then we had luck. The GPL license got enforced on the Linksys WRT54. With this device, we suddenly got a cheap Wi-Fi hardware with Linux running on it. Svenola Tücke and uh, lots of other people from Berlin and uh, all over the place in the Freifunk communities then started to create the famous Freifunk firmware. Um, and with this firmware, we have been able to have an easy configuration of wireless mesh nodes suddenly, and uh, deploying them was easy as well, because little machines, no, just like 486 machines, like bulky big things somewhere under the rooftop, and no, just pack them in a the box and uh, 
hang them to the roof or window. So a success story of pure meshing uh, began within two or three years. For example, Leipzig Frei from Knet grew to 600 nodes in an urban area, pure mesh, nothing really uh, planned. Um, it was a more chaotic a approach. In uh, Berlin, I'm not sure about the real numbers, but there have been numerous local, uh, local projects with a lot of backbones, some hundred nodes altogether. Um, in Weimar, for example, with this, uh, which is a little town of 50,000 inhabitants, we had around 250 nodes uh, just by throwing them more or less in the area. Um, unbelievable at that time uh, with a VPN intercity connection. Once we connected several Freifunk projects and the Funkfire projects and we had 1,200 nodes in one single oldest R mesh and this was like, wow, unbelievable. And there's a story behind why that huge growth in that short time was possible. Um, in the 90s, the German telecom decided to go for VDSL as a broadband technology, which is based on fiber. They have put the fiber everywhere in the streets and uh, they ripped uh, the copper off. What the fuck? Um, this was the biggest market failure ever happening to broadband technologies because they later decided to switch to ADSL which was based on I guess again copper. So huge areas of East Germany mostly had no chance to get broadband because there was no copper in the streets because they have put the fiber in and taken the copper out. Um, so to sum it up we had a suddenly a uh, ideal situation for community mesh projects. A working mesh protocol, cheap and easy deployable hardware, the Linksys, a human usable firmware, the Freifunk firmware. Uh, we had the desperate need for broadband or at least payable internet access in huge areas like these blind spots on the broadband map um, and some DSL lines at certain places which we could spread to uh, through our meshes through the people. So this was easily done by chaotically spreading nodes uh, where needed. Um, we had no time for structured networks because there was such a huge demand. Uh, we had a loose decentral community and a lot of interest and need for uh, the mesh. So Freifunk was basically a huge success. And uh, yeah, then a uh, turning point more or less came. Uh, since a while a steady decline in numbers of nodes uh, is visible uh, because people get real broadband now at home. So we even had people coming back to us two years after we, we flashed their Linksys machines to our firmware. They were coming back and say like, hey, I have DSL at home now. Could you please flash my router back to the original firmware? Which was like, why? But okay. Um, 3G is in part a real alternative these days and uh, we are all together facing a very unclear legal situation. People get sued for sharing mp3s or boring blockbuster movies um, because of it's a business model for lawyers. Um, so that led to a reduced number of available uplinks. So to sum it up, a chaotic ad hoc network building strategy which we did at that time helped a lot in the specific situation and may do again in similar circumstances. Um, our approach was perfect at that time um, but not anymore because the desperate need is not given that much anymore and uh, well-planned networks are way more uh, intelligent way to go. A pure mesh with random nodes and only little well-planned infrastructure is not maintainable at least not by a small community of volunteers, like Leipzig has five to 10 people. Um, so it's the question about orga to organize, how and uh, if you wanna, wanna make connections to local ISPs, for example, you better are a, some kind of entity and not just a loose group of uh, volunteers. And uh, so now we basically have to learn again from the different strategies in different circumstances uh, of Gifi, of Ninox, Funkfeuer, Ljubljana, and others uh, who always had to deal with the now present environment because 
we started in a totally different environment and therefore were able to have such huge success. But um, we now have to change our strategies. We see new approaches, new technological possibilities and uh, still an ongoing vision. Um, but then again, the future is unwritten. Um, lots of things to come. And that's basically it. Do you have any questions? Thanks for having all of us, us here. I have a question that I'm, I have in mind since a while. Um, did the German uh, government keep the fiber optics in the streets? And what about the copper? Did they had to put again the copper? Um, the government told the uh, former state-owned telecoms, which is private since mid-90s something, um, you have the agenda to deliver broadband to every household. Uh, but they took time. They just had basically to put the, uh, the, the copper back into the streets, but it took them huge time. So um, by now the copper is more or less everywhere again, and uh, so the situation is solved more or less. But, but mostly for uh, urban areas, in, uh, in uh, rural areas we still have uh, no chance of broadband at all. So that's where Freifunk branches are still very successful. Uh, just let me add something. Uh, the technology was developed uh, f for the use of ISDN in Germany uh, because ISDN was very strong in Germany. It was uh, the better subscriber line and they used uh, optical fiber. Um, but then Alcatel, who developed that technology, they were not able to deliver broadband internet over it. So they finally ripped out, after they had ripped out the copper, they added it again. So and now they're switching to VDSL and putting the fiber back in. I think uh, in some places intelligently they left it in, but uh, it's stupid anyways, the whole story. Yeah. Um, I think we, we move on with the Linux uh, presentation. Um, then again, I can only speak for where I am, the community I am in, which is Leipzig, and um, we uh, actually have been approached by our local ISP. Um, it's not that we talk to them, they talk to us, funnily, which is fantastic, and uh, they more or less offer at the moment um, to get rooftops of their very exposed uh, 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 standpoints, and uh, they even offer us to go through their dark fibers here and there, um, but basically the uh, telecoms owned fiber is used by them for their infrastructure and it's like everywhere, um, IPTV and all that uh, entertainment stuff is sooner or later going through it, I believe. Slides? Okay, because she, she will also do this. Yeah. So what shall we do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, hello. I am Claudio and here's Vittorio. And we come from Italy. Our community network is called Ninux.org or Ninux. I don't know if people on the left side can see the slides, if we, see, if we are here, maybe we should. <laughs> okay, so uh, the project was started in 2001 by a guy called uh, Nino, that's why the name of the project, and uh, he read about Seattle Wireless, that was a wireless community network that was growing at that time, and he wanted to do the same thing in Rome. So he just set up a website saying, 
hey, is there anybody out there willing to do a mesh network, a uh, community network in Rome? And people started to join, to visit the website, and in uh, like some months, we grew to, to from one to three nodes, okay? <laughs> Uh, at the beginning, the technology was very uh, rough. We we had uh, some some firmware already running on routers. We didn't have computers on the roof like Fryfunk had. But okay, it was still a, a very uh, primitive technology compared to now. Okay, so this was the situation. Uh, until we went to a wireless community weekend, that is an event that is held each year in Berlin. We met the Freifunk people and, uh, you know, uh, got in touch with their model. Okay. Uh, we we knew, we got to know OpenWRT, the Freifunk firmware, OLSR, uh, starting to use ad hoc devices instead of uh, WDS, that was the thing that we were using at the time. And it was a fully experimental network. That is, we didn't want to give internet to people. Just, you know, internal services, uh, pings, <laughs> just links that worked, okay? Uh, until uh, new cities started to jump in, okay? Uh, our, uh, as we were uh, on the scene uh, since many years, we were starting to get known. And so people from uh, Pisa, uh, from Sicily, from uh, the north of Italy, started to jump in the project. Uh, he is Vittorio, he's from Linux Pisa, and he will talk s say something about that. Hi, Ho. So we joined basically the Linux project quite uh, uh, one year ago in Pisa uh, by a group of uh, about uh, 20 students. Um, a group called uh, Egon Lab, and uh, we followed the, the the same project of Linux, uh, but maybe uh, following a, a different roadmap. Because uh, basically, we had uh, an EPv6 native mesh network, uh, which supports also by EPv4 uh, by tunnel. And um, uh, after a few months, uh, we noticed that. Um, um, we had some problems with the, the bandwidth because uh, uh, with an average of uh, 50, 60 uh, users, uh, uh, 60 users uh, we noticed that, that the bandwidth is not enough for all. And um, so we started to think uh, how uh, this, could be, um, uh, this could be fixed, uh, adding some services like uh, Diaspora, which we mentioned uh, in the yesterday, but basically is a um, is a social network, is a distributed social network, um, which um, which you can install uh, somewhere on your nodes in um, in the mesh network and call it themselves. And uh, we implemented also another another feature by some users on the network uh, called Bitarno. Because uh, we try, uh, we cut off the the peer-to-peer -peer ports just to arrange this um, this uh, loss of bandwidth, and uh, they set up this um, service use uh, ML Donkey uh, to to download the files, and uh, we provide also a book sharing. So because I, uh, as I said, we are all students, so we it could be useful for us to book sharing. And um, we hope to grow up uh, uh, more, more and more in the in the few in the next uh, years. Um, that's all. <laughs> okay. After uh, other cities joining in, uh, and after uh, a big, uh, you know, a slowdown on the growth of our network. That is, people were starting to get bored about experimented. Uh, experimenting, we began to uh, give internet on the network, okay? So we started to, uh, in Rome, I'm talking about, uh, we started to uh, put in, uh, give uh, internet access to social realities like uh, squats and associations. Uh, 
and we started to uh, abandon uh, somehow the, the pure mesh model uh, adopted by Firefox. That is, we start, we're starting to make nodes that are uh, links that are in uh, access point station mode. Uh, that is, links that uh, work well, that uh, almost everybody can deploy. Uh, and so, even if I am not uh, uh, for this kind of, uh, of mesh, uh, it, it works. And also because in Rome, everybody has broadband access. Everybody has an ADSL. So we need a, a, a different model to, uh, to give service to the users. Uh, and one of these models could be uh, a lot of bandwidth, like to uh, exchange uh, files over the network or stuff. And, but we're still using OLSR as the routing them on, uh, under there. OK, in Italy, we have also uh, some problems that other community networks are not experiencing. That is, we have uh, uh, data retention problems, authentication problems. Uh, until the, the last December, uh, we had to, in theory, to authenticate all the users of the networks. Now, after December, uh, the emergency law after 9-11, uh, <laughs> at least, uh, came down. So now we don't have to authenticate all people, but uh, the law is still uh, very fuzzy. We don't really know what we should do, OK? Nobody knows. <laughs> and the other problem is uh, that of links over public soil, for example, over the street. Uh, the law talks about uh, links owned by the same uh, uh, owner. That is, if you have a company and you have to cross the street, then you have to pay a tax and say where your link is and stuff. Uh, but it doesn't state explicitly what we should do if the uh, nodes on the side of the street are of different owners. OK, so it's not clear at all. The situation is very, very bad. <laughs> OK, here there are some photos. This is Rome. Uh, and the next slide uh, shows uh, some stuff in Pisa. OK, and I think that's all. If you have any questions, please ask. Julius? Yeah, can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, but I didn't take the hand. About the bandwidth problem, yeah. Julius is asking, uh, uh, how did you get aware uh, the symptoms of, of uh, the fact that the bandwidth was not enough for the users that you had in Pisa? Uh, how did you not notice? Yeah, we noticed that uh, the, the connection, the, the, um, the internet connection comes uh, uh, slowly, so, so slowly, and uh, we noticed that uh, the connection wasn't uh, enough for us. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> Basically, it was this, but. You are asking more about deploying nodes and access points. Yeah, right. OK, uh, at the beginning, we were deploying, uh, uh, you say, uh, out of the shelf uh, uh, access points. That is like Linksys WRT, uh, flashed with OpenWRT firmware, and then uh, uh, put inside boxes on the roofs with external antennas. Then uh, it came ubiquity. <laughs> OK, so we had uh, uh, together uh, the router and the antenna all together. Uh, very handy power over, er over Ethernet, that is that you don't have to uh, bring the, uh, you know, the power to the roof uh, already in there. And so we definitely passed to ubiquity. 
products at the end. And uh, we have a network that is almost all in 5 gigahertz. And yeah, I don't know if you have some specific questions on that. Okay, uh, in PISA, uh, we have a network that is ad hoc, full ad hoc, with omnidirectional antennas. Instead, in, uh, in Rome, uh, we are now uh, passing to uh, access point and star models with directional antennas. Okay, that is bad because you cannot easily grow the network. That is that you have to deploy uh, two routers for each link at the end. That is not much sustainable but it's very performing and that is good it attracts many people to the network to the community and yeah as far as it lasts uh, we'll keep this i think we have complete we have uh, uh, many stuff just out of the shelf we don't build uh, antennas or stuff anymore by ourselves, because people just take that that thing, put it on the roof, and it works. Yeah, where they have a fancy web interface, and everybody's uh, almost everybody can deploy nodes. So, okay. Okay, seems to work. Perfect. Okay, so I, um, thanks for giving me the chance to briefly talk about uh, the Funkfeuer network in Vienna. Um, so here you see us doing the regular routine works that many of us know. Um, essentially, I think f uh, as opposed to Freifunk network, I will talk about that still a little bit later, is Funkfeuer is really about like having your own infrastructure and having the freedom to, 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 to do that. Of course, Freifunk does that also, but you explained a lot of motivation for, for with the... Yeah, is, is, uh, okay, sorry, sorry, so with the success, yeah. Anyway, for us in Vienna, the background is, what my point is, that we have a very good um, cable and copper infrastructure in Vienna, so theoretically, we wouldn't need such a network um, from the pure uh, demand. So, but I think I also want to point you to something else, like, um, you know, this aspect of freedom uh, is not new. It's absolutely not new. It, like in 32, Bertolt Brecht uh, already wrote in his uh, theory of radio communications that he was dreaming that the, the radio and the ha amateur radio people at that time would create a vast network of pipes of communication. Two way, just imagine the, the BBC program going two ways in di both directions. You can talk back. You know, we have that now. It's, it's amazing, actually. So um, why do we do that? It's like the, the current internet also is a pretty big scale-free network. It's lots of concentrated nodes. A lot of concentration is at the i-axis. And I think, um, you know, it's getting more and more centralized. And what we're doing is actually uh, bringing back control to the edge. It's very important, and I think what you, when you observed what happened, let's say, in Egypt recently, uh, whenever you have such a centralized uh, approach, let's say a single, single um, ISP, like in, uh, uh, in um, Libya recently, single ISP going out of the country, uh, then you have a big problem. So we need absolutely for also for political reasons this decentralization. That's a very important point I want to make. Okay, so... Just contrast the centralized network with uh, any of the, our typical mesh networks. This is a, a map of the Funkfeuer network. Um, uh, I have to say, uh, you know, the many green links that you see there are also red links. Um, uh, some of them are just layer two connections. So there is actually it's like a virtual big switch. Uh, and uh, you see only the OLSR topology now. So it looks a little bit denser than it actually really is. But nevertheless, it's extremely 
um, well connected and extremely dense. So the funk for a network, um, for us, as I said, okay, Kloshi, correct me, uh, I think the motivation is very clear. It's censorship resistant. Uh, it's, uh, it's about having our own infrastructure, even though we have a very good uh, cable infrastructure. We have UPC offering like 30 Mbits now in, in the city of Vienna uh, for, I don't know, maybe 35 euros or something like that. Um, th we theoretically would have, according to the uh, city-owned um, um, energy company, uh, fiber to almost every home, but they don't turn it on because other ISPs would go out of business. Despite all that, we want to have our own independent network. Now, an important aspect I think that I can also um, show, show it to you people here, since you run your own networks, is how we achieve financial sustainability. This is, I think, important for you know, having a long-term uh, funded uh, network. Okay, but first, first let me talk how it started. Like, you know, to continue sort of Kloche's talk, uh, roughly at the same time when, uh, maybe a little bit later, when, um, you know, Berlin was experimenting, uh, we sort of got the same, same ideas, we got the same sources. I knew also people from Squadnet, uh, where Electro was also, I think, uh, some time, and uh, we got to know that there is some protocol called Mobile Mesh, and, you know, it sounded very exciting. Uh, then we experimented with uh, AODV. Uh, it didn't quite work. It was just simply not ready at that time, I guess. And then we uh, were Googling and found all this R, and it's, that was sort of, it worked. And then we found out, hey, there's a similar project in Berlin, also using all this R. So uh, the Fre Freifunk framework came in, everything got much easier. The whole thing just kicked off at one meeting that we had, meeting like here, we said, we are building a network. You are allowed to join. You will own your own hardware. Um, just you know, join the network, and um, here is how we connect. And these are the basic parameters. And here is how you get IP addresses, etc. I think another aspect, which was very important for Funkfo, is we got very early on. We got a support for ISPs. This is quite interesting because the ISPs usually think this would be a competition with them, but actually they have it. There was one ISP uh, uh, who has a tradition of supporting experimental networks. Um, and in fact, uh, this ISP also um, was originally already running the wireless network called Funkfeuer. Now, they sort of abandoned the network there and um, uh, through a book which documented some wireless work we've been doing before, I found like the guy at the ISP running the network, and he, want, he didn't want to do wireless stuff anymore because he was using the Orinoco cards, he was using standard PCs with ISA cards, and it all sucked. Yeah? And so I called him and said, well, you know, can we have the ne network? Can we have the 10 nodes, the, the 10 roofs? And he said, well, yeah, okay, as long as you're not doing anything commercial. So we said, deal. We won't, we won't make a commercial network, but we'll make a public network. And then we started the meeting, you know, everybody came to the meeting and joined, um, and that's how Funk4 really started. So we got immediately in the beginning, we got public IP addresses from the ISP. We were very lucky. Um, but it turned out it was not a problem for the ISP at all. It didn't turn out as a competition. It more turned out as an experimental ground for trying out new ideas, as, a, as even for, s for some people, you know, expert pool was emerging here in the field of wireless. Um, very similar to the ham radio people who uh, like to experiment with wireless, right? So we're still supported by that ISP, but by now we grew and we have our own uplink and our own fiber, and I'll, I'll come to that. So where are we now? We have a roughly, r roughly 240 nodes, uh, roofs actually, I should say, uh, uh, with um, roughly 600, uh, 700 uh, uh, edges. Uh, the whole network is repeated in different uh, towns in Austria. Um, we're 10 kilometers away just from the next major capital um, in next to Vienna, is, which is Bratislava. And we met with the people already from the hackerspace there and said we would do a cross-country link and um, sometime this year I hope it will be done. Then with Mita, we're planning a link to Slovenia from Graz. Uh, there is still some radio engineering planning going on for that. Um, 
we will also connect somehow uh, to a network called Hamnet, which is operated by the Ham uh, radio folks. And they got a big backbone network all over Austria. They're allowed to use higher power limits as Ham radio operators. Um, and we will not be directly transferring traffic because that's, that's, that would be illegal. That would be against the law. But it can be sort of as a you know, common access network to get access to the ham net network, something like that, with a VPN. But anyway, that's in the making. Um, the most exciting thing for us is, uh, like Ramon also said, is our, our own fiber infrastructure. Uh, we uh, built a fiber connection to the Vienna Internet Exchange. So that's two blocks, two housing blocks away uh, uh, from our main uplink. And that, that path, we did our own fiber optic line. It was rather expensive, um, but it's our own now, and uh, we have gigabit uplink there. So, yeah, I'll go to here. We have, uh, at our mi main uplink place, we have a seller. We got the seller, luckily again, uh, uh, very cheap or for free. Um, we just have to pay the electricity costs and we created a small server housing center there. So this is how it looks. You can put a server there. Uh, you'll have gigabit uplink to the internet. You just have to pay for electricity and for a little bit for the bandwidth uh, because we buy the bandwidth now ourselves. This allows us uh, as the free net community Wi-Fi network to buy the bandwidth uh, very cheaply at the Vienna Internet Exchange and just give it away to the people for the free net. Um, in return, very often people find, you know, hey, there's this actually this great server housing, and actually I have a server, and I want to have it like fully connected to the internet. I want to have access to my server um, uh, at regular intervals, and it's a central place, it's in the center of Vienna, and so they put a server there. So it's like a little bit, you know, serving our own community, but at the same time, our own community helps us and gets a server there uh, at roughly market rates. So actually a little bit below market rates. We're multi-homed, we're LIR, that's uh, uh, essentially RIPE member. We have public IPv4 and IPv6 space, and uh, that allows us to you know, run the network for the next 10, 15, whatever we want, years. It's very important. So here's a picture of the Vienna Internet Exchange in our um, connection there. This is one of the one of the yellow fiber cables is uh, our connection. <laughs> Don't ask me which one. Okay, um, services. We we're not as good as the um, um, Ethernet and Athens Wireless when it comes to services. We don't have that many um, because you know it's just the server housing and people put there what they want. But we do have a local TV and radio station streaming out from our so our server housing. We have a VoIP server. Uh, which allows incoming calls from the telephone network and outgoing calls to the telephone network. Um, every member of Funkfeuer can get a, a telephone VoIP extension, and the rates are extremely cheap, so cheap that we just put up a pot and say, you know, if you use it a lot, put in some, put in, put it, put in some cash into the pot, and it's covered. And this works. People, some people just, you know, phone a lot, and then at some point they say, okay, here's 30 euros. And it'll be enough for the next, I don't, know, I don't know, quarter of a year or something like that. So the VoIP server is really well used. People love it. And they can make uh, phone calls to the States uh, very cheaply and yeah, or of other countries. Okay, so here's still some pictures from the fiber digging. This was a great thing. By now, we uh, also bought our own fiber splicing machine. Uh, that's a rather expensive equi part of equipment, but... Uh, if you want to deploy more, uh, it definitely pays off. And it's uh, in the interest of the association to actually teach people how to build their own fiber connections because fiber is, of course, the ultimate, ultimate uh, path. Okay, I'm, I'm sort of finished, yeah? Good. Yeah, last words maybe. Uh, we, had the, we had also the Open Spectrum meeting uh, in Vienna uh, in 2009, I think it was, um, and again at the Wireless Summit. So the Open Spectrum Alliance is a, a group of people who uh, want to ask essentially or, or get more spectrum as ISN bands. I think that's very important for the further growth of Wi-Fi. Okay, that's it.
Uh, hi, uh, my name is Mitar Miltinovic. I am from uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, I will present uh, our network there, uh, which started as uh, Vrna Ljubljana network. Ljubljana is a major city of Slovenia. Uh, and But currently we are slowly growing to the uh, being Vrna Slovenia, which is uh, like a countrywide uh, network because also other network, uh, other cities um, are joining in. So from the city-wide uh, network, we are now going to the uh, countrywide network. So uh, we have like uh, currently a, a bit split personality of two names. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but that's uh, how it is. And I hope that soon you will know us most mostly about Valencia, Slovenia. Um, so this is Slovenia. It is a really small country in the middle of Europe. Uh, and we like that because we are around a lot of great countries uh, which we uh, hope we will collaborate more about Austria Bau, uh, which uh, you heard uh, from uh, Aaron already, and also Italy and Croatia. Uh, because also in Croatia they are not here, but they have quite a big uh, network, community networks there, uh, really active people. And I hope um, that we will not just cooperate uh, between networks like on these uh, meetings, but we will also start doing some international links between our uh, networks. Uh, so that we will have our own uh, links and not just VPN tunnels. Uh, so what what's our idea most uh, our idea was um, uh, of the, our network is to give uh, pe uh, um, to the people internet, uh, but not because they uh, don't have it, but because they don't have it when they're moving around, when they're in open spaces, when they are outside in parks uh, or, or at uh, bars and so on. So in um, so somehow the idea is that you, wherever you are, you can connect to some of our nodes, uh, which are then connected with VPN tunnels to so the central servers, which are connected to the internet or other uh, wireless networks. Uh, our project is quite young. We started in 2009 uh, with this uh, approach. Uh, there were some efforts before uh, um, at one uh, hack space, uh, Cyberpipe in uh, Ljubljana, uh, we had uh, like a uh, lot of experimenting and so on, and uh, also uh, we should thank uh, Funkfire because uh, from uh, at they had one presentation of their network in 2006, I believe, uh, where they in fact um, made a workshop and showed us how they are doing things. So we learned uh, from first-hand experience uh, what the mesh is about and how to do it there. And so we got two notes then uh, at that time. And then three years, nothing. And then 2009, we decided to really uh, pull off the thing and start doing it. Uh, so currently, it is like this: that we have like 50 nodes in the Ljubljana and of, uh, in other cities a little bit. Uh, then we are really small community, so we have like around 10 active people. We we have a lot of supporters from different sides of spectrum in society, like or from organizations, universities. Um, companies different and of course um, individuals. Um, current rate of users are around the maximum peak of at the day is 30 different users, uh, but and current currently we had around 90,000 uh, users. That's non non unique users in the sense they connected to the network and use it for some time uh, in these uh, two years now. Uh, so what? interesting in our approach is that we get uh, got late into it, so really late in, if you compare with other networks. And that in Slovenia, because we are so small uh, and have some strange uh, is issues with internet providers fighting themselves, is that uh, in the cities almost everywhere is now fiber available and that this also means that you have two fiber links going to your home and you can choose between them. Uh, which means really cheap fiber and uh, fast fiber and redundant fiber or whatever you want. Uh, because of this, the initiative from other, um, the motivation from other networks was not like, uh, uh, was not really working, you know, saying to people, connect to it, you will have internet and so on. Uh, but it, uh, so the, um, we had to change the, our, um, uh, approach and we, s we said, you know, you have it, you have 20 megabits at home. You have a lot. You don't need it so much uh, all the time. You are not at home uh, all the time every day, um, and you can share it. If you share it, you share one, two, three megabits. And if enough of people will do this, 
we will cover the whole city with the free internet access. So when you're at home, you, you can use your fiber, but when you, you move around, why not uh, use some some access, access fiber and then um, he will use his yours and so on. So we will cover the whole city uh, for uh, um, in some community approach and everybody who will move around and which is today with all the smartphones and laptops and so on um, and uh, fast uh, life uh, very often that you're not a lot of at home but you're a lot of somewhere else where you need internet access. And this is quite useful. Uh, this is really uh, triggered off the everything, uh, this change of ideas from uh, I don't have internet to I have internet, so share it. Uh, so we really then from these two nodes came to five fifth, uh, 50 nodes in almost a year and a half. Uh, a lot of users is using it and we now have a problem that we have too many requests um, for that they would like to join in uh, into the network then we can handle in the sense of even talking with them, you know, this is the how should you do, you do and, and help them, I know, um, with setups of ne uh, antennas and how to um, put it uh, and where to put it. Uh, what we did, uh, yeah, so the idea is that if we do all this, uh, we will have it everywhere, so internet and connectivity. Um, so we are, we are doing this most in the cities currently because there is a lot of fiber. Uh, but as I said before, uh, we hope because of our uh, location in the center of Europe to be uh, somehow uh, connecting um, other um, countries around us. And because we are small, this can be easily done to connect uh, many neighbors with um, just a few hops. Um, so what we are doing is also uh, doing our own development in technology. Uh, we are mostly, that may be interesting for in comparison with other um, networks I uh, was speaking about, mostly uh, currently uh, software-oriented um, 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 volunteers, so in the sense that we are not so much into hardware, but we like to develop some uh, good tools to develop uh, and maintain the network, so we are developing one nicely done, I believe so. Uh, not watcher a system for maintaining the network, which is like um, helping tool for um, all aspects of uh, working with um, uh, networks of our kind, uh, which allows people to simply register a node and, and, put, uh, and, and guide them nicely how to do that. Um, so that they, they can just plug in into electricity at the end and the node works. So no manual configuration or anything. And uh, currently we are starting also doing hardware. Uh, we, because of those long links with other countries and so on, we have some uh, guys joining in uh, to do that. Uh, yeah, so um, what other thing? Um, yeah, so um, we are small. We, we hope that we will grow uh, um, more and more. Um, and I believe that such events as today and uh, this week is really important to share the, uh, ideas and knowledge. Uh, and when you be in Ljubljana or Slovenia, you're more than welcome to try out our network. Uh, we hope it will be even better then. Uh, just uh, last slide to misuse this talk. Uh, we are going home on Tuesday. And if anybody is going on Sunday to Barcelona, uh, maybe he can or she can uh, pick us up. So me and DNA, we are two guys not speaking anything except English. So please uh, tell us. So, okay. Thank you for everything. So battle match six in Slovenia. Yeah, cool. You have two years to grow, so it's uh, it's good. Any questions? Of course, this is this is also I think uh, important to or already starting doing so that we should start uh, with uh, connecting our networks with VPN tunnels. So we are also doing this with Greece, more or less successfully, uh, because of their pro problems with uplink. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is I think is also important that we uh, connect uh, our own networks uh, with VPN. But the best thing would be also then later on we have also um, concrete physical li links of our own. Yeah. No more questions?
So I see that we conclude the the part that we share with uh, Sax, and now we're going to split uh, Battle Mesh and Sax people for the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ah, thanks. Ah. Are you going to plug it? Are you using Windows? <laughs> Thank you. So, better much. <laughs> so, we we almost uh, started the network the same time as everybody else. The network started on uh, 2002, but we didn't uh, we didn't collaborate with anybody really, <laughs> and we still don't in a way. Well, no, we have a few VPNs like with Slovenia, and maybe we're starting uh, collaborating a little bit more with uh, with the rest of the European community. So it all started uh, because of because uh, of uh, the the lack of uh, bandwidth, the lack of uh, broadband. And uh, at the same uh, time, it was uh, it sounded a good idea to start off uh, a wireless network the same way as uh, they did in states. <coughs> so somebody came up in a forum, and I said, uh, "Are you interested for a network?" And then many people started uh, gathering around a DSL line, so they started sharing this in a multi-point way until uh, we decided that the best way to go would be like uh, start building point-to-point -point links and uh, making a high bandwidth uh, community. So this is roughly what it looks like now. This is like uh, about uh, a thousand nodes. And um, basically you can't really see all thousand. It looks like a, a mush of uh, colors. <laughs> so, so what is it actually? It was founded, as I said, 2002. Its members like uh, from uh, many s different um, parts of uh, the community and from Athens. Um, it now grew up uh, to be like a big, ne big network that is extending 110 kilometers away from, uh, from the center of Athens. It's uh, about um, east to west 85 kilometers. Well, this starts like recently really grown because uh, we actually started connecting to the south of Greece and uh, from there to other communities, um, right uh, to almost uh, the east side of, uh, of Greece, extending uh, the reach properly to 200 kilometers away from Athens. Um, generally, we think the network is an oasis of education. We've done um, loads of uh, workshops for uh, open source, for uh, closed source software, for uh, everything that comes uh, into into our reach, and uh, that has to do with uh, wireless networks. Um, what we do is like we didn't know for internet, but uh, merely the the ability for everyone to voluntarily like um, create, uh, whether it's software or create links and network, and uh, to live uh, the broadband in our kind of way. So, what are the people? Who are like uh, committed to to the to the metropolitan wireless metro network, uh, Athens wireless network, metropolitan network. 
um, out of a study, it showed not to be that it was uh, about 31% uh, people like from 18 to 24 years old, and 52% uh, it was like uh, other amateurs or professionals from 25 to 35 years old. And um, there was a small amount of uh, also uh, ham radio amateurs that they also were committed to, to the whole ideals. So motives, we would say then uh, in the study, we're saying that it's high speed broadband, which was, we didn't exist. Um, the, the ability to, to provide and also to have like high bandwidth uh, and hungry services to have creativity, to, to do experimentation, but also for uh, loads of so other social uh, reasons and uh, psychological reasons, we could say, which is popularity and respect and friendships through the communication of the community. Um, technologically wise, we use uh, every single band, every ISM band. We started out when, uh, using a 802.11b now we use A uh, as our backbone. And, uh, and only recently, for almost about uh, two years, uh, we've been creating our own infrastructure on uh, 802.11n. Uh, the routers are mainly software routers, but recently we moved more into embedded uh, solutions. Um, the active nodes now are like uh, almost 2,000. They're not the backbone nodes. The effective like uh, bandwidth we have at certain po points of the network would be almost 150 megabits. And um, there's a more than 2,000 uh, connections, 730 access points, and uh, over 1,000 a, a active services. So we also have like an association with uh, the certain goals pretty much like uh, similar to everybody. And as I said uh, earlier, like both uh, based on the social um, factors, but also based on technical or, so or so dissemination and knowledge. And those are some pictures now that I got. Those are like uh, feed homes we used for certain installations. And they're like test ones for uh, 802.11n. Um, those are like uh, patterns that are quietly, quite uh, widely available, and I have uh, shared it with uh, different people uh, from uh, for the community. Yes, those are built like uh, by some members. This is um, an installation we have uh, on a mountain, uh, which uh, it's uh, through our collaboration with the broadcaster. They allowed us to use every single mountain and all the big installations they have for broadcasting TV. Um, Actually, we didn't have like uh, we're not we don't have like the financial sustainability to fund all uh, every single mountain, but uh, we used two or three installations to connect like all parts of Athens with uh, different areas, which is like Evia and um, other parts uh, to the to the south, the Peloponnese. Um, those uh, this is like a dish that it was. Uh, actually set up for the mountain and with the relevant bandwidth tests that are shown here like over 100 megabits <coughs> that's is this is probably a more similar installation we do um in 2002 ah let's go that's this is uh, services that are available at this point as uh, portals email servers uh, instant messaging services uh, community forums uh, SIP, uh, SIP gateways uh, recently, we innovated our um, VoIP center with um, authentication and uh, trying to, to get uh, also like a, a central point where we can connect like all the lines uh, for uh, providing uh, free phone calls for maybe. Also, we got uh, broadca broadcasting services and uh, uh, video, music, uh, radio stations, uh, file services, high resolution gal galleries, uh, anything that you can get your hands on when you have like a high bandwidth. Um, on top of the network, we recently built um, um, a small uh, open mesh. Uh, we had the luck to, to get our hands on like about 150 routers 
that were provided by another big project that was uh, uh, given a, in a, they were given a way to, to was that um, a luck? Basically, sponsorship by the youth. So we started deploying them uh, around Athens on top of our backbone. So that means that this is like basically mostly street access of uh, of our network. We also provide internet and access to the services of the network. Um, the other things you can find is our forum website, um, the wireless node database, which is like a um, community day built uh, project. It provides uh, the coordination of the whole network. It has a status of uh, of uh, which uh, s which nodes are like built with they have a, a backbone or they have like an access point. They are also doing it's also doing the, the IT planning and automatic uh, DNSing of top top level domain of the dot a a w u n. Ah no yes <laughs> we. We were we were planning like going to another like which is for the whole of the Greece which is dot WN, well, and let's hope this this gets like out uh, in EU and we can uh, have it for the, all the wireless networks. So, this is uh, some features that were shown. I, I mean, I only put this uh, presentation together like in the last ten minutes. So some features like is showing uh, how we can calculate elevation and uh, visibility of links and line of sight. And how do you provide as well uh, the the domains and the IP ranges for uh, for all the nodes in uh, in the network? Oh, went back. This is uh, our radio dot AWMN. This is a list of radio stations you can get. Uh, broadcasting services like uh, YouTube. We have WL Tube. Like we had movies, TV stations that are also uh, sharing their feeds. Uh, galleries. Media knowledge bases, uh, learning sites, uh, a library which had like a massive amount of uh, PDFs and everything, um, a routing status of the network, Nagios for monitoring, basically a weather map. I'm just going through them, you know, like fast so you can have a look. This is uh, an attempt on for OLSR. This is a confederation that we have uh, within the network where they're testing OLSR. Uh, some people know the guys that, uh, that are working on this project, like uh, Asynonix. Speed tests on different uh, parts of the network so that we can uh, basically see what sort of throughput that everybody gets like on some different parts. The SIP telephony projects, uh, even uh, I system watching for uh, boats all over the Mediterranean Sea, uh, as well as uh, weather stations. I don't know, uh, mailing, uh, mail servers. We have Google instead of Google. Uh, we have Yahoo instead of Yahoo. Uh, I don't know, domain availability, mirrors of uh, different open source projects, uh, proxy mesh, which everybody like joins with uh, uh, with a proxy, put in an assembly mode. Uh, I don't know. Loads of stuff, basically. I'll just go through them like that. That's it. It's <laughs> yours. <laughs> I, I like the wake up call uh, service uh, from the voice over IP. Uh, how do you handle all the legal aspects with all these services? No legal aspects. <laughs> <laughs> In Greek, there's no legal aspects. <laughs> well, most, most of the stuff are legal. <laughs> most? <laughs> yes, uh, I would say 88%. Ah. <laughs> 0.697. <laughs> Let's make a break and uh, move on to the next uh, slot of talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>